Let's step into the shadows of the feared Mongols Biker Club, where an enigmatic leader holds all the cards and calls all the shots. Shrouded in mystery, this figure holds sway with an iron fist and strikes fear into the hearts of all. Who is the cunning puppeteer pulling the strings of the Brotherhood's might? Scott Jr. Erickson is the most fearsome Mongol leader ever. In the year 1980, Scott Jr. Erickson became a member of the Mongol Motorcycle Gang. He served as president of the National Club four times and saw it expand from a few hundred members in California to thousands of members all over the world. Junior prioritized the Mongols over everything else, demonstrating that the Mongols are more than simply a motorcycle club, they are a brotherhood, which is a large part of the reason the club has become as well known as it is today, a brotherhood for which he had been willing to lay down his life for 30 years. A friend and junior went fishing at the lake in 1974 when he was very young. A large man with a lengthy beard and hair rode up on a motorcycle and parked it near the lake while they were there. As they watched the rider dismount and light up, they saw that guy was wearing a vest with a Mongols motorcycle club patch. Even though the man was only there for about 10 minutes, the impression he left on 14-year-old Junior who was there to see it remained with him forever. Do you know what he did next with his thought? He began daydreaming about owning a Harley Davidson motorcycle after picking up Easy Rider magazine and reading them religiously. At the age of 18 in 1978, Junior spent $3,400 on a Harley Davidson Superglide. Not long after arriving in California, he began to hear reports of a bloody conflict between two of the largest motorcycle clubs, the Hells Angels and the Mongols, over the state's territory. Junior began interacting with other club members as time went on. Junior joined the Mongols that day and began participating in weekend riots with them. After a few months, he was invited to the clubhouse of the Mongols' San Diego chapter, where he was formally introduced to the chapter's members and president. Junior's personality and demeanor changed for the worse the day he joined the gang. His brothers had given him a Smith & Wesson 38 Special as an initiation present, and he had grown his hair and beard long. Junior had no fear and thought that he was invincible when he first joined the Mongol Motorcycle Club. But he quickly learned otherwise when three of his brothers were killed in the first year. Two years later, Junior and his brothers got into a fight at a pub with a member of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, and Junior wound up shooting and killing the Hells Angel. Local publications blamed the Mongols Motorcycle Club for the shooting, and the police went on a manhunt for the gang's members when the incident gained widespread media attention. After hearing that three of his brothers had been arrested and charged with first-degree murder and that the police had issued a warrant for his arrest, Junior hastily got out of town, transferred to a Mongol chapter in Tulsa, changed his name, and hid in Oklahoma for six months with the help of his Mongol brothers. Junior's arrest didn't come long after. In 1986, at the age of 26, Junior was paroled out of prison. He was happy to be out of prison, but he was unhappy with the conditions of his parole, which stated that he was not to have any contact with any member of the Mongols Motorcycle Club for one year, and if he did, he would be sent back to prison. Unwilling to turn around, to comply with his parole, Junior got a lawful job, but the day he was released, he reconnected with his brothers and almost immediately became the vice president of the Mongol San Diego chapter. A year later, he was asked to become the Mongol's national president, making him the youngest national president in the club's history. As time went on, Junior became increasingly devoted to the Mongols, to the detriment of nearly all of his other connections. In 1998, Junior and one of his club brothers were out at a pub when they were attacked by a man wielding a knife. To defend themselves, Junior smashed a glass over the assailant's head, knocking him out. Junior and his brother thought the incident was over, so they rode off on their motorcycles. However, the man decided to press charges, and a warrant was issued for Junior's arrest a few days later. When he was taken into custody, Junior tried to explain that he had acted in self-defense, but the police officers didn't seem to care. After a favorable judgment was overturned and Junior's return to jail was ordered, the parole officer found that he had breached his parole. Junior became a folk hero in the Golden State because he tirelessly fought for the rights of Mongols everywhere. What are your views on him and his passion for his motorcycle club? Do let us know your opinions in the comments below.
Introducing the epitome of fear, the most feared man in the history of Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, also known as the HA, the Red and White and the 81 have carved their name into the annals of infamy. With 6,000 members in 467 chapters across 59 countries, one name reverberates with a resonance all its own, Frank Armin Hainabuth. Brace yourselves to know more about him. In Garbsen Osterwald, Germany, Frank was born into a middle-class family. From an ordinary life, he became the leader of the Hells Angels in Europe. But how did it all start? Fate took him from Carpentry to Hanover's Red Light District, and in 1995 he rose to prominence as a president of the Hanover chapter of the Bones Motorcycle Club. Let's have a look at how did this journey shape his destiny. In 1999, Frank joined the Hells Angels and became a powerful leader in Hanover, Germany. His chapter grew in wealth and influence, making Frank a respected figure in the criminal world. However, his reign was short-lived. In 2000, he faced arrest for trying to set up brothels in Hamburg. He was found guilty of a violent crime and spent three tough years in prison. But Frank didn't let this setback break him. After his release, he focused on expanding the Hells Angels in Hanover and throughout Germany. He was praised by the media for bringing peace to the once chaotic Steindorfertel, a neighborhood known for its violent clashes between Albanian, Russian, and Turkish gangs. But did you know that Frank Armin Hannabuth had a different side too? Yes, you heard it right. Newspapers like Hanoversch Aldzemen Zettung and the New Press revealed his sophistication and respectability. Through his attorney, Getz Werner von Fromberg, Frank built connections with political and business elites in Hanover. But then, on May 24, 2012, a raid by the State Criminal Police Office of Lower Saxony and GSG 9 shook the underworld. What happened next? The investigation into alleged contract killings ordered by Hannibuth was dropped due to lack of evidence, leaving behind an air of mystery. After the raid, he sought refuge in Mallorca, where he assumed the role of the president of the local Hells Angels chapter. But his sanctuary would be short-lived. On July 23, 2013, he was arrested in Mallorca, facing a multitude of charges. As the man in charge of the Hells Angels operations in Spain, he and his fellow club members were accused of forming a criminal organization, promoting illegal prostitution, drug trafficking, and money laundering. Following his arrest, he spent four weeks in solitary confinement before being remanded in normal custody in September 2013. In October of the same year, he was transferred to Madrid along with 17 other suspects. His confinement continued in the high-security wing of a prison in El Puerto in Santa Maria, where he awaited his trial. Throughout his tumultuous journey, he defied the odds. In July 2015, two years after his initial arrest, he was released from custody on a bail amounting to 60,000 euros. However, his freedom came with strict conditions, requiring him to appear at the police station once a week. But here's the twist. In July 2017, amidst the ongoing legal proceedings, Hannibuth found solace in the union of marriage. Can you believe it? He married his longtime girlfriend, Anna Sarah Nauman, in a ceremony held in Wissendorf near Hanover, making a personal triumph amidst the turmoil. After a lengthy legal battle, his trial in Spain on charges of membership in a criminal organization finally began in January 2023. And let me tell you, he was the only defendant who used his right to a final statement before the trial was adjourned Friday evening, and he used it to insist that his organization was democratic. We are not a criminal organization. We are the only biker club in the world that is based on a democratic structure. That means one person, one vote, he said. He denied that there was a president of the group at a national or international level claiming that each chapter is independent. His lawyer had previously requested the court during the closing arguments to acquit Hannibuth, but Spanish prosecutors are asking the judge overseeing the trial to fine him 4.2 million euros for the money laundering charge. The trial is expected to last several weeks. Prosecutors are seeking a 13-year prison sentence for him, as they consider him a key individual in the scheme that moved his group from Hanover to Mallorca after pressure in Germany increased. A sinister power cloaked in leather and spurred by rebellion emerged from the shadows of the 20th century. 
The name Hell's Angels alone was enough to strike fear into the hearts of many. Their mysterious leader, Sonny Barger, seemed to live on the outside of society, constantly testing the limits of what was considered acceptable. They made their mark in history with every turn of their turbulent journey, leaving a wake of destruction and unrelenting defiance in their wake. Let's check out what specific actions or decisions did this Hells Angels boss take that made him the most brutal of all the gang leaders. Born in Modesto, California on October 8, 1938, Sonny Barger is a man who defied all odds to become one of the most notorious and celebrated figures in the world of outlaw biker gangs. His mother abandoned him and his father to raise him after four months when she runs off with a Trailways bus driver. His father is a day laborer who spends his nights and most of his money at waterfront bars, often bringing home women and children who have been abused. In 1956, Barger co-founded his first motorbike club, the Oakland Panthers, with a group of fellow military veterans, but things changed for him as he found his true calling in life. Having joined the army with a forged birth certificate and being kicked out 14 months later when his deception was discovered back home, Barger struggled to find his place in the world. Hurry up and barge, one of the most infamous and feared members, Barger eventually becomes president of the Oakland Hells Angels and travels throughout the state of California negotiating territory and alliances with other Hells Angels chapters. However, with great power comes great corruption, and by 1960, the Oakland Hells Angels have established a massive narcotics network, becoming one of the most dangerous drug-dealing organizations in the country. In the early 1960s, the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club grew in size and notoriety, becoming one of the most feared outlaw biker gangs in the United States. Along with their increasing notoriety comes an increasing number of run-ins with the law and a growing number of slayings, making Barger a symbol of everything that is wrong with the criminal underworld. Despite Sonny Barger's presence at the Altamont concert and the fact that he was not involved in the stabbing, he was not charged in connection with the incident, the event and the Hells Angels involvement cast a dark shadow over the club's contribution to the concert and the lives of those who attended. Meredith Hunter, 18, was killed when she was stabbed by a Hells Angel after aiming a firearm at the stage. But this was not the end of his brutality. There was one more person who was killed by Barger. Do you know who we're talking about? We will let you know soon, but before that, in the 1970s, there were some other challenges waiting for him. Barger faced more legal trouble and was eventually sentenced to four years in prison for possession of 37 grams of heroin and possession of an illegal firearm. This period marks a turning point for the Hells Angels, as the federal government begins to take a more aggressive stance against outlaw biker gangs, specifically targeting the Hells Angels. Although the legacy stopped him from living life to the fullest, he continues to ride the open road, eventually expressing a preference for high-powered Hondas and BMWs over the Angels' traditional Harley choppers. Through it all, Sonny Barger never loses his edge. He remains a rebel to the end, defying authority and pushing the limits of what is possible. Later in 1972, Barger, along with Hells Angels members Sergey Walton, Donald Dwayne, Whitey Smith, and Oakland Gary Popkin, was accused of murdering Servio Winston Aguero on May 21st. Aguero was a drug dealer from McAllen, Texas, who had traveled to Oakland with a shipment of narcotics for sale. Richard Ivaldi, a prosecution witness, said that he saw Barger shoot and kill Aguero in the bedroom of an absent acquaintance's house and that Barger then ordered the others to set fire to the building. After a seven-week trial in which Ivalde's veracity was called into question, Barger and his three co-defendants were found not guilty on December 29, 1972. Sharon Gruhike, Barger's girlfriend, said she was in bed with him at the time of the murder, and thus had no reason to suspect him. So these were some of the ruthless life decisions taken by the founder, Sonny Barger. What motivated him to do that is maybe his will to establish his dominance and fear over others. What do you think could be the reasons behind Barger's ruthless acts? Do share your opinions in the comments below. Imagine a world in which a single encounter can start a violent rivalry and devotion turns fatal. This is the terrifying truth of Mick Howie's life, not a work of fiction. However, who would have the audacity to murder Australia's most notorious biker boss? Watch closely as we solve this riddle. Mick Howie.
Born in Beirut, Lebanon on May 9, 1980, Mahmoud Hawi and his family sought safety in Sydney, Australia from the chaos caused by the Lebanese Civil War. With this move, Hawi started a trajectory that would eventually take him to the top of the Comanchero, one of Australia's most infamous outlaw motorcycle groups. Hawi grew up in the suburbs of Sydney, where he regarded his upbringing as modest yet boring. He was well known for his large, robust stature at Punchbowl Boys High School. Although his early years appeared normal, a storm was building underneath. Howie's life changed dramatically in 1999 when he joined the Comanchero Motorcycle Club at the age of 19. He put himself on a collision course with fate with this decision. When William Jock Ross created the Comanchero in 1968, it was first a fraternity for motorcycle riders who felt rejected by society. But under Ross's direction, it developed into a group that was closely associated with illegal activity, such as drug trafficking and bloody turf conflicts. Howie established himself as the club's leader right away with his commanding presence and captivating personality. Howie's ambition and thirst for power culminated in a daring and ruthless act in 2002. He organized a group of younger members to overthrow Ross. Howie and his friends gave Ross a thorough crushing, taking possession of his Harley Davidson and club colors. This was more than just an attempt to seize power. Howie took over as the new national president and supreme commander of the Comanchero. The Comanchero increased their operations and engaged in more illegal activity when he was in charge. Howie's combination of ruthlessness and charisma throughout his reign won him both enemies and allegiance. On March 22, 2009, the Comanchero and Hells Angels clashed violently at Sydney Airport. This horrific confrontation not only claimed the life of Anthony Zervis, but it also thrust Howie into the dangerous national spotlight. On that day, both Howie and Derek Wainohu, the Hells Angels Australian national president, happened to be on the same flight from Melbourne to Sydney. Words were exchanged during the flight, and by the time they landed, both leaders had texted their gang members, calling for backup at the airport. What ensued was a public and savage battle, shocking bystanders and security personnel alike. The fight was brutal and unrelenting. Gang members used metal bollards, meant for crowd control, as weapons, turning the airport terminal into a battleground. Amidst the chaos, Anthony Zervas, the brother of a Hells Angel member, was viciously beaten and ultimately lost his life. This public display of violence shattered the image of bikey gangs as mere rebellious outcasts and exposed the dangerous reality of their existence. Law authorities had Howie right in their sights because of his role in the altercation and Zervis's subsequent death. In addition to his involvement in the airport incident, he rose to prominence in Australia as a symbol of the growing threat posed by outlaw motorcycle gangs. The tragedy changed the face of organized crime in Australia by sparking a national crackdown on bikey groups. Two years after the infamous airport fight, in 2011, Howie was confronted with the full weight of the law. Anthony Zervis's murder was the charge against him, and he was found guilty. The trial was a well-publicized case that attracted a lot of media coverage and public interest. Law enforcement celebrated Howie's conviction as a major win in the ongoing war against organized crime and violence by biker gangs. This triumph, though, was fleeting. In 2014, there was a significant reversal of Howie's murder conviction. The evidence used in the trial was deemed insufficient by the New South Wales Court of Criminal Appeal to support the murder conviction. The public and legal community were taken aback by this ruling, which called into question how well the legal system handles organized crime. After his murder conviction was overturned, Howie and the Crown worked out a plea agreement. On the lesser allegation of manslaughter in connection with Zervis's death, he entered a guilty plea. Howie's tactical choice to enter this plea helped him avoid facing the murder charge again but it was a choice that would follow him around for the rest of his life. 
he received a sentence that included a maximum term of six years and two months, as well as a three-year and six-month non-parole period. The difficulties and complexity involved in prosecuting prominent members of organized crime were brought to light by Howie's conviction and the subsequent dismissal of his murder accusation. His story came to represent the continuous conflict between the police and the criminal motorcycle gangs. It also emphasized how arbitrary the legal system is, with decisions often depending on how evidence is interpreted and technicalities. On February 15th, 2018, Howie was gunned murdered in broad daylight, putting a devastating end to his chaotic life. The day was like any other for Howie, who had tried to keep a low profile since being released from prison. He went to the Fitness First Gym in Rockdale, a suburb of Sydney, for his normal workout. Unbeknownst to him, it would be his final. As Howie returned to his car, a gunman approached and fired multiple close-range rounds, wounding him in the head and body. The onslaught was savage and precise, leaving no opportunity for survival. Bystanders and rescue personnel were racing to Howie's aid as the murder scene descended into chaos. The extent of his injuries was too severe for them to handle. After being taken to St. George Hospital in severe condition, Howie passed away from his wounds, leaving a violent and contentious legacy. The murder of Howie was the subject of a thorough inquiry. Important evidence was provided by local CCTV cameras, but the gunman's identity remained a mystery. There were several theories on the assassination's motivation. Was it a case of competing gangs exacting revenge, internal bikey politics, or something more intimate? Yusuf Nazlioglu, a former close friend and associate of Mick Howie, emerged as the main suspect in the intricate network of theories and suspects that characterized the inquiry into his assassination. Their formerly close relationship had soured over what appeared to be a minor incident during a fishing excursion. Following their falling out, there were rumors that Nazlioglu, feeling betrayed and degraded, may have sought the ultimate retribution. But the issue remained. Were there more sinister, deeper forces at work here? Or was this just a simple case of personal betrayal? In the months following of the incident, theories abound. There were conjectures that the homicide stemmed from internal conflict within the Comanchero organization. Rivals may have boiled beneath the surface due to power vacuums caused by Howie's leadership and subsequent exit from the team. Others wondered if rival gangs might have been involved, considering Howie's past and the Comanchero's tense connections with other biker factions. The world of biker politics is notoriously opaque and nuanced, making it challenging to identify a single incentive or offender. The real mastermind behind Howie's murder remained elusive despite protracted police investigations, a plethora of interviews, and the examination of CCTV material. With every explanation regarding the case being equally credible, it was a maze of possible reasons and suspects. The public and law enforcement were left with unanswered questions as a result of the lack of clear proof and definitive leads, which further served to deepen the mystery. The death of Mick Howie brought attention to the chaotic and often dangerous realm of criminal motorcycle gangs. It emphasized the fact that loyalty can mean the difference between life and death in this murky underworld and that alliances are brittle. His murder remains unsolved, posing a gloomy reminder of the lawlessness and unpredictability of gang disputes to those who seek justice and closure. The real mastermind behind Howie's murder is still unknown despite in-depth investigations and prosecutions. Was it a gang feud? an internal power struggle within the Comancheros, or an act of revenge from a former friend. What do you believe to be the true reason behind the murder of Mick Howie? Post your ideas in the comments section below.